In spite of the mistakes it's made, and the hilariously underestimated development times, I believe that Star Citizen has done a great deal to shake up the concept of what is possible for a video game to do. Whether it succeeds or fails, the mountain of research and development it sits atop will make its way out into the world, with the potential to influence software and simulation design across the entire industry. As gameplay experience goes, there are a lot of caveats that fans of the game will expect to hear, and others that its opposition will want mentioned. Rather than cater to the expectations of the various factions involved, I'm going to give you my own honest take on what this game is. If you disagree with me, feel free to make your case in the usual places. The Intergalactic Aerospace Expo was my first real exposure to Star Citizen a few years back. It's a huge event, hosted inside the game, where players can explore a hall filled with all the available ships and vehicles from a given manufacturer on a given day. It's far from fast-paced, and definitely not everyone's cup of tea. But it is unique because it highlights the sheer attention to detail and realism that this game is committed to. Nearly every display has fully modeled interiors that are mostly interactable. Display ships have been modified so they won't start or fly, and the various weapons or turrets won't move or fire. For that part of the experience, you can rent anything on the floor that is in flyable condition, at no cost. It's the ultimate demo for the uninitiated, and quite the whimsical idea, given anyone can play the game for free during IAE week, so new players with zero flight time can rent anything, and get an idea what they want to work towards. Each ship and manufacturer has a specialty, with specific strengths, weaknesses, design themes, and target audiences, all of which inform how and where a specific ship gets used the most. What never fails to impress is just how lived in that Star Citizen feels. From the ships, to the settlements, to the full-sized landing zones that host IAE each year. Everything you see, hear, and do has been meticulously thought through, with emphasis on it making sense in the context that the game provides. There are still elements of science fantasy at play. Ships use artificial gravity to facilitate designs not unlike the inside of real ships and aircraft, leaning into a trope that pervades this form of science fiction storytelling. Ships also leverage a quantum drive to facilitate near-light-speed travel inside star systems, and a jump module to interface with naturally forming wormholes on the edge of most star systems. Engagement distances in space and on planets are limited, and the energy weapons behave more like laser bullets than the real deal. Ships and fighters maneuver at slow, relativistic speeds comparable to what the aircraft of today are capable of, on planets that are one-sixth scale, in systems that are likewise shrunk down to match. The end result is a flight and combat model that feels like World War II got a science fiction reskin, with some modern warfare concepts tossed in to better season the overall experience. The end result feels natural, easy to grasp in concept, but extremely difficult to master. Be warned, Star Citizen's combat is definitely not an experience for the casual gamer. Learning how to fly these ships will take time. The learning curve is more of a learning chasm, such that full mastery of all the various systems takes months, though the basics come in a matter of weeks. You have to be willing to be patient with yourself and proactive in seeking out people to play with, and who can help you figure out how this all works. Should you stick with it, I have found that Star Citizen is one of the more rewarding games to learn. Combat is, thankfully, not a required skill to enjoy the game. Casual players are not left out in the cold, though they will need to be friends with someone less than casual should they choose to venture out beyond civilization. One of the ways that Star Citizen seeks to balance the casual and hardcore infighting that can develop in similar games is to create an ecosystem where both sides are dependent on each other to thrive. Traders, haulers, miners, touring ships, and other non-combat vessels will need support from combat pilots to move through dangerous areas. These combat ships will need to be refueled, rearmed, and repaired between engagements. Injured pilots will need to be rescued, 
and receive medical support. All the various ships that perform these support roles will themselves need supplies, creating a logistical gameplay loop that is complex, likely requiring multiple casual players for each combat pilot in the game, most of which won't be required to fight in order to fulfill their chosen speciality, though this is not the current experience in the game right now. As currently implemented, ship maintenance is nearly instant, with fuel, ammo, and repairs magically popping into existence on or in your ship when requested at a station. Eventually, though, physical crews will need to run out to your ship to attach fuel lines, ammunition loaders, and new hull plating in a process that will take time to complete. Ship combat is currently dominated by light fighters, like the Arrow and Gladius which are intended to be cheaper, entry-level combat ships that are easy to come by. Progression in PvP essentially starts and ends with these two ships, and a handful of other ones, like the Anvil Hurricane. One of next year's large updates is expected to radically alter aspects of the flight model in an effort to address these issues. But as it currently stands, a Gladius or Arrow is capable of killing basically any target in the game, if the pilot is patient enough, to chip away at it for long enough. Core FPS combat is well matured in Star Citizen, though some supporting aspects of it are undercooked depending on what you're trying to do. Planetary navigation is extremely difficult, on foot or in a vehicle, due to the lack of a working minimap, compass, or waypoint system. So it's easy to get lost flying or driving around in anything that doesn't have a quantum drive, since route plotting or waypointing are both handled through the quantum drive mode. Loadouts and weapons are well designed and highly dynamic, with a wide array of weapons on offer for merchants throughout the game. Current weapon selections include standard offerings like shotguns, submachine guns, and assault rifles, with accessories like scopes, muzzle brakes, and tactical lights. Sniper rifles and other heavier weapons are also available, but must be looted from locations in the game world though the most popular by far is the shoulder-mounted railgun. Learning where to go, how to set up armor, and how to navigate to various mission sites can be a challenge, though the on-foot systems are decidedly less complex than their ship-based counterparts, who need to memorize a lot of controls on a keybind, or build extremely complex HOTAS maps, to use the hundreds of functions available while flying a ship. The custom keybinding system in Star Citizen is fairly advanced, capable of manipulating and fine-tuning to an impressive degree. But the interface design is poor, and in desperate need of a redesign, something that remains on the horizon as the entire user interface system in the game is dependent on a new UI technology that is currently being developed and anticipated in the moderate future. This new interface will touch on everything in the game interaction, from menus to the computers and ships and vehicles. With optimizations for everything from basic navigation, to star map route plotting, to looting and inventory management. The looting system, as currently implemented, is a bit of a chore to deal with. There is no easy take-all button, meaning that players have to navigate a cumbersome interface that has a tendency to lag, and can leave players exposed to incoming fire. Understanding the various layering and interactions between different items isn't always clear with full inventories often being difficult to navigate when searching for a specific item, though this is a direct result of the sheer volume of options for setting up equipment and weapons. Armor is highly variable and modular, allowing players to mix and match kit as needed for the task at hand, though all armor requires an undersuit to mount and cannot be worn over regular clothing. Armor comes in light, medium, and heavy variants, with heavier armor offering more storage and greater damage resistance, though at the cost of mobility. Backpacks can also be attached to armor, though they need to be matched with compatible armor systems. Armor also comes with environmental ratings that affect where and how they can be used. Some armor, in addition to damage reduction, is rated for warmer or colder environments. Using the wrong armor for an environment results in a loss of survivability, and the start of a survival estimate countdown that restricts how long a player can be exposed to that environment before becoming incapacitated or dying outright. All armor comes with ammunition pouches, from which equipped weapons are reloaded, 
Heavy armor offers more slots, providing for longer and more complex engagements with multiple weapons. Ammunition is handled realistically, with each magazine tracked and managed independently. Reloading a partially spent magazine will not return the unused portion to a central reserve, like in Call of Duty or Destiny 2. Instead, that partially expended magazine is returned to an ammo pouch and replaced with another full magazine. If all magazines are partially spent, then the most full magazine will be selected from those available. Empty magazines are automatically discarded, but any new magazines not in an ammo pouch are ignored. To add fresh ammunition, a player must physically move it from inventory to an ammo pouch. Players have to buy each magazine for each weapon that they plan to use, and then manage their use of that ammunition through an operation. Unless a teammate, or hostile, happens to be using the exact weapon you are, and is carrying extra magazines, there will be no ammo refills. This mechanic can be brutal to the unprepared, in that it makes combat logistics a critical consideration when planning an operation. If you know you could be out for a long time, not only do there need to be plans for getting ammo, but you also need food, water, and medical supplies in the event of an injury. Running out of any of these materials can potentially ruin a mission with lethal consequences. If you want to have a vehicle of any kind, then you also need access to a ship capable of transporting it where it's needed. Not too difficult if the vehicle is small, like a rover or hoverbike. Tanks, SAM launchers, and troop transports are a different story and present more complex and expensive logistical challenges to field and keep armed. The more hardware you want to bring, the more effort is required, and the less subtle that operation will become. At scale, these constraints mean that large operations will naturally require combined arms planning, since any opponent you face will need to counter any actions you take on the ground and in the air. In practical gameplay, there are still a lot of balancing issues with these systems. Ground vehicles like the Ballista are incredibly powerful, with the Centurion and Spartan being largely irrelevant. The Nova tank can be powerful under specific conditions, but has a more detectable profile, weak anti-air capabilities, and limited effective weapons ranges that leave it vulnerable to small ships where the Ballista's missile and torpedo complement excel at securing kills before the launcher itself becomes detectable. Being able to find your own fun in this game is key to enduring occasionally dry content spells between patches or before a database wipe. The player population is larger than it's ever been, but can still be vulnerable to underpopulation when things slow down, and massive overpopulation during major annual events like IAE or Invictus. Likewise, the game is prone to bouts of significant instability under heavy load increasing the likelihood of some of the more common issues. Elevators of any kind in Star Citizen are fickle, murderous creatures liable to ruin gameplay sessions at any moment, randomly ejecting players into space, smashing them into collision surfaces, trapping them in invisible, inescapable physics boxes, or depositing the inattentive into a floorless infinite void. Many player organizations have special rules, and some even have specific training courses regarding elevator etiquette intended to help mitigate these issues, largely driven by the dedicated servers which run Star Citizen's world. Proper elevator training helps a great deal, but does not prevent all problems, with the ultimate solution being improvements to the game's netcode that raise server tick rates. One of the updates planned for 2023 is expected to help address this problem though work on these systems is expected to take several more years. If you do choose to play this game, you have to be prepared for jank, bugs, and other unintended events that can potentially ruin your night. These won't happen every night, but they are a common issue that should be expected several times a week, depending on how often you choose to play. The typical minimum game package is $45, which gets you a starter ship and game access. The starter ships available at this price are limited, but workable, with the Aurora being the better choice for those unsure what they want to do. It's possible to spend a lot of real money on this game, but I strongly recommend against doing so until you know Star Citizen well enough to reliably complete contracts. It doesn't really matter which ones, so long as you can get through them and enjoy yourself doing it. Star Citizen also allows players to upgrade their starter packages, 
applying the value that they have already spent towards the cost of something else. For example, if a player wanted to upgrade from an Aurora to a Pisces shuttle, it would cost $15 and not the full $60. Just be sure to use the upgrade option and not the buy standalone or new options, though any purchase beyond the base $45 is entirely optional. All ships, vehicles, and weapons are earnable through in-game, normal gameplay. Some skins, variants, collectibles, and cosmetics will remain exclusive, but these items are rare and usually earned through participation in special events or specific accomplishments. New ships and weapons are granted pledge store exclusivity that lasts a few months before being made available to everyone. Anything earned through normal gameplay is, however, subject to be lost during a game update and database wipe, a process that is guaranteed to happen several more times over the next few years. Make no mistake, the pledge store in Star Citizen engages in marketing tactics that are designed to promote a sense of urgency when special events are going on. They will try to make you feel like you are missing out on a great deal by artificially limiting stock, or putting limits on special ship availability. I can do a video on how to navigate the pledge store in the future if there is enough interest. It can't be argued that the pledge store is effective at raising funds, but the strategy does present a problem for the theoretical post-launch environment this game will eventually arrive in. It's been said in the past that Star Citizen will transition to a different revenue model when it launches, but I have some trouble believing that will happen when the current model is so cash-rich, especially when competitors like DCS World do something similar in order to fund their realistic recreations of real-world military jets. The drive to innovate and continue to support Star Citizen in perpetuity won't be cheap, and there will have to be ground given in other places if the pledge store goes away. I have yet to hear a definitive plan from any credible source as to what that model will look like, likely because there isn't one yet. A lot of other questions are left unanswered about a multitude of other things in Star Citizen, but there is also a lot of transparency about the overall state of the game and current plans for future development. Those familiar with Elite Dangerous will find the contrast in community relations profound. None of this is to overlook the flaws in the very incomplete condition of Star Citizen as a whole. There are a lot of broken loops, janky networking issues, bugs of all kinds, murderous elevators, and other problems that have to get sorted out and will likely take years more to work through as new things get bolted in. All of this is an exercise in patience. Occasional long gaps of silence from development sources and constant revision in the never-ending quest for improvement that has been a consistent theme throughout the project. In spite of all of this, Star Citizen is a net positive, warts and all, and it's one worth considering should you find yourself looking for something new. Putting money into this game is a risk. It's always possible that something goes wrong, but given the momentum that this game has acquired over the years, I find the odds of Star Citizen failing as a result of internal issues to be minimal. Barring some dramatic external event in the greater global economy, I expect it will continue as it has been, and eventually evolve into something great. But, as with all early buy-in games, one should be prepared for disappointment and willing to accept the risks. That's all I have for today, so I'll catch you all later.